Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, everyone. Um, that's a Māori greeting. Uh, New Zealand is a bicultural nation, and it is uh, multilingual, and we always recognise our Indigenous people, the Māori people, so that's why we started with that welcome today. Um, it's been fantastic the couple of days I've had here in Argentina. It's very much like New Zealand in terms of the climate, the friendliness of the people, and a couple of things that really struck me uh, being here, first of all was uh, meeting people. Uh, whenever I rang and said, let's have a meeting, the first thing they said, oh, it's morning, let's have breakfast in a meeting. And then at lunchtime, it was, okay, let's go for lunch and have a meeting. And if it's the afternoon, let's go and have afternoon tea or let's ha have dinner. So I don't know how you all managed to remain so slim with having all those meals. And secondly, uh, the interpreters are absolutely fantastic. I have no uh, fluency in Spanish, but um, I've been to a couple of meetings, and I've sat there, and I've said something, and uh, the person has explained it in Spanish, and then I've had the reply in Spanish from the other principal, and it's gone on for about two or three minutes, and then I said, oh, what did he say? And the person said, oh, I agree. <laughs> So the conversations were quite long, so I'm pleased that we are uh, speaking uh, in English today. Um, you'll see an image, um, hopefully, of a tuatara up here uh, now. now. I know people seem to be fixated with uh, John's lion, and I just wanted to give an alternative, an alternative perspective. This is a tuatara. It is a native lizard of New Zealand. Interestingly, it doesn't sexually mature until the age of 20. It doesn't, it, start, it only mates once every four years. But the one thing it has over the line, it is still mating and having sex at 120. And that's without Viagra, so it's done very, very well. So instead of having the image of the line stuck in your mind, think of the native New Zealand tuatara. Now, today's topic is on investing in educational success and communities of learning. First of all, I just want to talk about New Zealand because I was in San Francisco um, a couple of months ago um, and got talking to a number of Americans. And I'm sure that's not the view here, but some Americans thought that New Zealand was a long beach off the coast of Australia. And one American asked me, uh, I'm going to New Zealand in a couple of months' time. Am I going to see any hobbits? Uh, I did have to say, uh, although it's in Lord of the Rings, he's probably not going to bump into them in our main centres walking around. <clears throat> so there are some interesting facts about New Zealand. Um, first of all, uh, we have about 4.5 million people, which is about, I think, the same size as Buenos Aires. It's um, a very spread out country and very few people. One of the interesting things people always find amazing um, is that we have 20 million sheep. So that's about nine or 10 sheep to every person. It's something the Australians uh, often make jokes about. Uh, <clears throat> for me though, um, it's interesting that the price of uh, lamb chops in New Zealand is very, very expensive despite the fact that we have 28 million sheep in the country. Obviously home to the All Blacks, and I know that the Pumas are going to be playing against the All Blacks uh, shortly. So if you want to, uh, I think, uh, if you're a betting person, I'd put some money on the All Blacks rather than the Pumas. I think the odds are about 10 to 1 at the moment. And of course, Lord of the Rings and now uh, holders of the America's Cup. We're the first country to give women the vote, although some men in New Zealand, I think, deeply regret that. <laughs> and one third of the country is a... Uh, protected national park. So it is an amazing place to visit. It goes from uh, subtropical in the north right down to basically Arctic conditions in the south. So if you haven't been to New Zealand, I would uh, strongly recommend it. It's got very close ties to Argentina. There's a direct flight from uh, Auckland to Buenos Aires. And when I was on the plane coming over, lots and lots of um, Argentinians visiting New Zealand. In terms of the context of our education system, um, the government invests about 5% of its GDP in education, which is about $13 billion. That's gone up every year for the last four or five years. One of their concerns is getting value uh, for money, and that's one of the reasons they 
put in place this program of investing in educational success. A uh, small country in terms of the school sector, only 2,500 schools and six universities. Our ranking in PISA, although I'm not particularly wedded to saying that's the most important thing we should think about, has been reasonably uh, constant. We were ranked uh, seventh best in science and reading and 13 in mathematics. I just want to focus uh, briefly on some of the major issues in New Zealand, uh, which have come across lots of other Western jurisdictions, and they may be issues here in Argentina. Uh, the first one is the whole issue of, of uh, equity, or the disparity of achievement uh, between schools and within schools. Um, that's been a major issue in New Zealand for the last 10 to 15 years. It's an issue that we haven't been able to crack. So when we talk in New Zealand about priority learners, these are students um, that are normally Māori, the natives of New Zealand, Pacific Island students, students with special needs, and students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Those students don't do well in our mainstream schools, either in primary or secondary, uh, despite lots of interventions and lots of money thrown at it. And it's interesting that you're also in the same school where you'll get top achievers, and some of our 15-year-olds can cut it with the best in the world. Even within those schools, we still have large pockets of students who are significantly underachieving. And why is that a problem? Well, in New Zealand, when we look at our demographic, um, Māori and Pacific families are growing in number, so they're having lots of children. European families are having fewer children. So what they are predicting in New Zealand from a statistical point of view, we're going to have a very large group of young Māori and Pacific people. And when I was working in Māori, I looked at some of the, the faces in front of me, which were ma mainly Māori and Pacifica, and I thought, I'm going to be relying on these people to pay my pension in the next 10 to 15 years. And if all those students don't get a good quality education, aren't going to be able to help New Zealand be a first world economy, we're going to be in trouble. So that's something the New Zealand government and the Treasury has realised, that in an education system, it is about equity. It's not good enough just for our top students to achieve well. We have to ensure that all of our students are achieving so they can grow, get a job, contribute to the economy, and maintain the standard of living that people want. Um, the impact of poverty on educational outcomes. Um, like most Western jurisdictions, the gap between the rich and the poor is increasing, and educators are seen as the conduit to be able to solve that problem. And while I recognize the, the absolute importance of high quality leadership and high quality teachers in classroom, it is in New Zealand to some extent an elephant in the room. That is, policy makers need to turn to the fact that if people are living in cold, damp, overcrowded houses, the children are coming to school and are not well fed, if they don't have the necessary books at home, um, that's really one of the key indicators of students underachieving. Educators will do their best, but the reality is they have them for four or five hours per day. So what we've asked the government to do, and it's been taken on board, is we need a dual approach to this. We need to raise the standard of living, giving people a working wage. We need to look at making sure that homes are fit for purpose and that children are well fed and come to school and are in a fit state to learn. Uh, teacher and principal effectiveness. Um, again, um, a lot of work has been done by the Education Council in New Zealand around teacher effectiveness. One startling thing we realized, which seems self-evident uh, to a lot of people, but only dawned on us a few years ago when we compiled the research around teacher, uh, teacher recruiting. And it's the whole issue of disposition to teach. Uh, I've been struck in my role as a principal for 14 years, uh, working in schools where I've come across teachers that fundamentally don't like children. I don't know if you've struck that yourselves. They go their way to avoid being with children. They worry about picking up their paycheck every two, every two weeks. Um, it's a struggle to come to school each day. And I often used to feel angry about that, but now I just feel quite sad about it, that you're in a profession that inherently, if you don't like children, um, how are you ever going to be successful? And no matter how much professional development you throw at it, 
how much tutoring, how much mentoring, if that's your inherent way of thinking, um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be there. So thankfully, um, the Education Council has recognized that, so everyone that applies for a job has to have a personal interview, and they assess, does this person have a disposition to teach? The Singaporeans have taken it a step further, which is a model I think we should adopt. They require anyone who wants to be a teacher to actually go into a school, work there for a few months, and then get sign off from the principal and other teachers in the school to say, yes, this teacher has a, disp a, a disposition to teach. Essentially, they like children and they can work with children because all the other stuff you can actually put in place. But fundamentally, if you, if you don't particularly like children, it's just not going to work. Um, disengaged youth. Um, in New Zealand, we have 90,000 students who are either not at work or not engaged in education. And that's a massive number of people. It's really bad for them, and it's really bad for New Zealand. And we had a, a, a talk from the Chief Youth Court Justice uh, Judge in New Zealand recently, who said that between 70 and 80% of the people that come through the youth court system are functionally illiterate. They've dropped out of school, they can't read or write, uh, and they can't engage in a meaningful way in, in education. Now, some of us might think, well, that's not our problem. But in fact, uh, educators, all of us have an obligation to ensure that students don't end up that way. The judge also said the next time you're out on the street and you find your car being broken into, or you come home at night and you find you're being burgled, chances are it might have been one of those students that ended up being expelled from your school that ended up in the youth court system. So there's an obligation that we feel in New Zealand that every student uh, needs to have a pathway that leads to some sort of success. Because if those students don't, they end up in the youth court uh, system. It ends up costing them personally and economically and ends up costing the state. In New Zealand, on average, when we keep someone in a youth court facility, it costs $54,000 a year. A totally non-productive way to keep someone. And when they come out, 70% of them, after serving their time, go back in again. The circuit breaker in all of that is education. Okay, so getting to the, uh, the government's policy, which is called um, IES, Investing in Educational Success. In New Zealand, for the past 30 years, we've had a scheme which is called Tomorrow's Schools. It was quite revolutionary at the time, and what it did was set up boards of trustees which were elected parents to run each school. And that's uh, state schools, Catholic schools, and private schools. It's a very good system, and it's worked very well. It has, however, had some adverse uh, consequences on the education system in New Zealand. It's essentially a market-driven model. So each school acts as an island. Each school is in competition with another school. We compete against each other in regards to academic grades. We compete against each other with respect to recruiting the best and the brightest teachers in terms of facilities. So there isn't a great deal of cooperation. In that environment, uh, schools either sink or swim. Um, the idea was that by competition, the schools that were underperforming would see how well other schools were doing and would lift their game. The reality, however, has been that schools that are underperforming go into a cycle. They get a negative perception from the community, they get less government funding, teachers become demoralized and leave, they attract fewer students with a lot of ability, and it's very, very difficult to get out of that cycle. Likewise, the high-performing schools get larger, they get more operational funding, they attract brighter students who are able to get more facilities. That system is not good for the country nationally. And the, the government had only very blunt instruments to intervene to do anything about it, and often took many, many years and a lot of students lost years and years of good quality education. 
So what they did was embark on uh, an enterprise to look at the best performing systems in the world, and they looked to places uh, like Finland and like Singapore. And what they discovered there was that there was a high level of collaboration between the schools. Schools that cooperate with one another, share best practice, ensured that it lifted the achievement in all of the schools. And so that was the model that they tried to replicate under this new policy of investing in educational success. So in terms of um, the investment, the, the government has invested uh, $359 million uh, over a four-year period. They want to create 250 communities of learning. And the underlying principles uh, behind it are improved and shared quality teaching and leadership. Now, I just want to talk uh, briefly about uh, quality teaching because part of the impetus behind this is providing alternative career paths for teachers. The traditional way of getting promotion in a school is to actually be an outstanding teacher and then to apply for a managerial role. So you then become an assistant principal or deputy principal and then principal. One of the flaws in that, of course, is that well, a couple of flaws. Uh, the first one is some outstanding teachers would rather remain in the classroom. That's why they became teachers. They're passionate about teaching and they want to remain in the classroom. The conundrum for them, of course, was how will I get any more money? How do I get promoted if I just remain a classroom teacher? In Australia, they've got the master teacher uh, path. In New Zealand, there wasn't really any alternative. And when you talk to a lot of senior administrators, one of the, their great regrets is, um, while I enjoy being a, a deputy principal, I enjoy administration, I really miss the classroom, and I really miss the contact with the kids. That's my first love, and that's where I'd rather be. So this um, system, um, IES, uh, created uh, two layers of leadership which allowed teachers to remain in the classroom, yet get additional pay and gain leadership. And they are called um, across school coordinators and lead teachers. So in my case, we have nine uh, Catholic schools. We have approximately three and a half thousand students uh, in our community of learning. And that has created four across the school coordinators and 22 lead teachers. The across the school coordinators are released from the classroom teaching for two days a week and they are able to work uh, across the schools, the nine schools, working with other teachers in, in best practice. They get an additional $16,000 a year for that. And the lead teachers are teachers that work within the school, and they are released for uh, two hours a week. They get an additional $8,000. And again, um, they have become teachers who can demonstrate best practice and support their colleagues while remaining mostly in the classroom situation. So in terms of the communities of learning, it's uh, setting up approximately uh, 10 schools that come together as a community. It's important that um, they have what's called the pipeline effect. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in detail because it was something, despite the fact having worked in education for uh, over 30 years, I didn't realize the importance of. And it's only through this project that we've come to realize how important the pipeline effect is. That's where children go from early childhood to primary to secondary. And as was said this morning, uh, our education systems are very, very siloed. I'm not sure what they're like here in Argentina, but the early childhood sector in New Zealand has very little to do with the primary schools and primary schools have very little to do with the secondary schools. When we brought all the principals together and the across the school coordinators, we found out directly, you know, why, why is that an issue? And when the teachers in the primary school who leave at year six and come to us at year seven, um, it's those transition points which can cause students to fail and come off the rails. So they go from an environment where they have a homeroom teacher 
and that teacher teaches them all the subjects. They have a teacher that is very student-oriented, and then they move into a secondary school context, and all of a sudden, they get five different teachers during the day. They've got to move around from classroom to classroom, and for some students, that is um, very, very, very difficult. And we didn't have discussions as secondary school principals with primary school principals. How do we prepare students for that transition from primary to secondary? So now we're having those conversations. The other important thing we, we discovered was we, we weren't very good at information sharing. So we had in the primary uh, schools uh, a whole lot of data that could have been really useful to us. They, they have things which they call a special needs register. So that register uh, records all the students that have got things like uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, autism, and it describes the condition, it describes the program that the primary schools were using to intervene to support that student. It also describes students with special abilities. That wasn't passed on to the secondary school. So as soon as they started the secondary school, it was like a, a clean uh, canvas. They had to start all over again. And quite distressing to some of the parents because they often came to the secondary school in the first few weeks and said, hey, didn't you realize my child is uh, autistic or my child's got dyslexia and he's just been given a five-page assignment to do? Clearly, that's going to be really difficult for them. And so we busily record all that information. But with the communities of schools now, we have a transition of the information that they collect from early childhood, which is passed on to primary, and primary are now passing that on to secondary. So we know the children that are coming through the system. And that's really, really important. And for some, it's been um, a really enlightening process that the teachers, before they even arrive, they know who they are. They know their strengths, they know their weaknesses, they know everything about them. They don't have to start from ground zero. Aggregated and individual school data. Um, again, um, this has been a very positive aspect of the communities of learning. Because what happens there is that each of the primary schools came to the secondary schools and shared their story. In our case, um, some of the primary schools said, look, um, we're not, one of our weaknesses is science. Uh, we don't have laboratories. We don't have teachers that are particularly trained in science because we had the secondary school science teachers complaining. They said, and I, and I guess, um, I'm not sure if it happens here, but it's quite a big thing in New Zealand, they, they get into the blame game. So the secondary teachers say, you know, if only those primary school teachers had done their job properly, uh, we wouldn't be inheriting all these problems. And then the primary say, well, it was early childhood. You know, if they were school ready, we wouldn't have to do all this intervention to get them ready. So this has effectively stopped the blame game. When we came together to discuss our stories, what we discovered was the science teachers in the secondary school said, look, when the children come here, they should know something about the scientific method. They know very little about scientific vocabulary. We want to know a little bit of physics, a little bit of biology, and a bit of chemistry. So we all thought it would be a good idea to send that to the primary school principals and teachers and say, hey, look, do this stuff in primary school. So when they come to us, it's going to be a lot easier for the science teachers to do their job. Um, what came back was a difference in philosophy. And again, this is something that we've had to work through uh, in terms of a secondary school mindset and a primary school mindset. And I think it's got to do with the fact that secondary schools are focused on content, they're focused on examinations, and they're focused on assessment. Primary schools, on the other hand, have a strong focus on the student, uh, developing them holistically. And so when we said to these primary schools, this is the stuff you need to tell them. This is the stuff they need to learn before they come to us. They said, no, no, we're not into that. What we do with our children, we create a sense of awe and wonder and discovery. That's what we think science education is all about. Um, 
Not that the two are mutually exclusive, but now we have dialogue between teachers in primary schools teaching science and the teachers in the secondary school. And what the secondary school science teachers are beginning to learn is, let's go back to basics. Actually, science is about, first of all, creating that sense of wonder and awe and discovery. It's not just all about formulas. It's not all about assessing work. And, and I think that's, you know, that, that, that has been a, a, a huge benefit. Um, the other great thing is the sharing that's gone on between the schools. Uh, the primary schools did complain they didn't have labs in the same way that secondary has done. So we had a science teacher who was an across the school coordinator. He thought about this problem and he set about solving it. And what he did was he created little trolleys with trays and he put in beakers and test tubes and all the things that they might need for basic experiments. We got funding from the government and we took those little trolleys to each of the primary schools. He set up professional development. He trained them in how to conduct those basic experiments. And so that's been a great win because kids in the primary schools now have an opportunity to conduct basic experiments which is going to support them when they get to the secondary school. Uh, a little bit about the aggregated data. Um, th this is a, a process where we submit all our results and the data is all aggregated together. So we can see across three and a half thousand students where are the strengths of the 10 schools, or the nine schools, and where are the weaknesses? And that's been a powerful thing because we have a lot of resources we can deploy to sorting those issues out. For example, in the special needs register, we discovered that out of the 3,500 uh, students, we have approximately 250 that have dyslexia. Um, that's a lot. So what we're able to do there is say, let's develop uh, professional development for all of the teachers working with students with dyslexia. Let's bring in an expert that can work across all of the schools. Let's bring together all of the special needs coordinators to support those students in each of those schools. Uh, we discovered that writing is a major issue uh, in the schools. I'm not sure why that is, but one of the reasons postulated is that because students are using devices so much that they've forgotten the art of writing. And the reality is um, that they're still going to have to write exams. Our universities require exams to be in writing, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So we've had to have a refocus on getting the students to write well. <coughs> so uh, getting back to the, the cold position, so I said we have four across the school coordinators, a project leader, which is myself, and the 22 lead teachers. The Ministry of Education um, also provides targeted professional development. And just one aspect I want to talk about there is uh, the whole issue of a change manager. Um, it's one of the opportunities and one of the difficulties that we have struck, that when you're working across nine schools, what you want to see is best practice. What you don't want to see is poor practice, and what do you do when you find poor practice? And that's a difficult conversation for me as a principal to have with another colleague uh, about what's going on in their school. It makes it a little bit easier when the government says we're prepared to provide you with professional development. So we had in one school <coughs> Maori students that had been underachieving for two years. No change in their achievement at all. The explanation from the principal was they come from very poor homes. That's what, you, that's what happens. So very much a deficit model of thinking. We're able to go to the ministry, identify within our, our own community of learning, uh, schools with a similar population, and see that those students actually were making significant progress. So we're able to say to that principal, um, hop in your car and drive to this school and have a look and see what's happening. They were able to do that, identify what was being done well in that school, and then take it back to their own. It was under the previous model, which was a deficit model also, that principals didn't move out amongst other schools to find out how they were improving and to identify best practice. So 
So these are achievement challenges. So with our aggregated data, we discovered that reading for boys uh, for Māori and Pacific was well below the national average. Writing, again, for boys in Māori and Pacifica was below the national average. Mathematics for girls in years five to eight and additional learning needs. So in our, as I said, we had uh, 250 students with dyslexia. We have a large number of students with autism, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, and a various other ranges of uh, compulsive disorders. Again, um, that's really useful data to know because <clears throat> the expertise in each of the schools that could be tapped into the across the school coordinators and the lead teachers to resolve that. Uh, science, improved delivery and teacher capability. Um, again, that was one of the big success stories because in our primary schools, the vast majority of primary teachers conceded that science wasn't their area of expertise. And because they lacked confidence in it, they often omitted to cover that in the curriculum. The teachers in the secondary school who were trained uh, biologists, chemists, and physicists were able to provide that targeted professional development to their primary colleagues. The other great thing about that is the science teacher from our school, um, who was a physics teacher, learned a lot about being student-oriented because he told the primary schools they need to know a little about, about physics, they need to know about velocity and levers and vectors, and the teachers in the primary schools said, well, how is that going to happen? And so through that dialogue, he created uh, Lego and Meccano sets. And he went to the primary schools, and he sat down with the kids, and they instantly started putting the Lego together and the Meccano, and through that, he was able to explain all the physics concepts that he wanted to get across. Again, um, you know, absolutely amazing for the kids, wonderful for him because he became more student-oriented, and it provided a great deal more professional development for the teachers. <coughs> So coming back to the, uh, the benefits of Coles, uh, first of all, I think it's uh, stopped the blame game between secondary and primary and, and early childhood. So we are working more as a cooperative. And we realize that each stage the child is in, the development stage, we have a part to play, particularly in the transition from early childhood to primary and primary to secondary. Passing on the information that they start to collect in early childhood right through to secondary school. So, so important, seems so basic, but the reality was it wasn't happening. Instilling ownership of all students in the community of learning, and that's been a really difficult one. And I still get challenges around that because my own school, John Paul College, we're a decile seven school. We attract students from reasonably wealthy homes. They do exceedingly well in National Certificate of Educational Achievement. But we have some schools that are in poorer areas and the kids aren't doing so well. And some of my staff say to me, you know, why are we caring about those kids down the road? They're not in our school. We don't own them. We should only be caring about the kids at John Paul College. The reality is some of those students are coming to our school. So if we invest in, in them, in our resources, our professional development, and our support in them, by the time they get to John Paul College, um, we're, we're not going to have any, any major issues. The other big issue around that has been um, the concept of a coal. If you think it's just about a division of resources, then it becomes very problematic. So some of the schools said, okay, there's 22 lead teachers. It's based on the population of the school. Those three lead teachers should be coming to my school. And why isn't the across the school coordinator spending more time in my school? But the principle is it's a needs-based approach. So if one of the schools is the most needy, irrespective of where those students are, that's where we put the resources. 
And that fits well with the Catholic philosophy because it's about equity. It's about lifting the achievement of all of the students. It's not about dividing up the resources and you getting your cut of the pie. We care about all of the students in our community, all three and a half thousand, wherever they are. And if more happen to be in one school and we have to spend more money on that and put more professional development in there, then that's what we have to do because we are a collective. We're about raising the achievement of everybody. What are some of the challenges that we've had around coals? Um, coals um, exist through goodwill um, and consensus. So if we, as a group, decide that we want to do something, uh, one of the principals can say, I don't want to do that, I'm out of here. So I have no actual designated authority uh, in a community of learning, unlike the superintendents in the United States. So everything that we do has to be talked through, everything has to be reached by consensus. And some of the principals have decided in some programs that they want to opt out. Or some have decided, <coughs> this is the way we do things in our school, I'm the master of my own kingdom, I'm not going to do that. And there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, thankfully, it happens very rarely. Most people buy into the collective, most people buy into the programs that we want to run in the schools. Managing underperformance and poor practice in a coal is difficult because when the across the school coordinators go in, they identify in that school where poor practice is happening. Now, you don't want them to be a threat to the school, um, so the way we've overcome that is to have a, a private one-to-one -one conversation with the principal to say, look, this is what I've identified in your school. Um, it's not consistent with best practice. I'm not going to do anything about it, but I'm just sharing that with you. Most principals that receive that information are pleased to receive it, uh, they act upon it, and the, and, the, and the matter is then remedied. Um, achievement data is probably one of our um, most difficult uh, issues. Uh, every school has a different system for collecting achievement data. So in New Zealand, we use things like progress and achievement tests, uh, ASTL, and the schools are pretty wedded to the way that they collect data and analyze it. And it just makes it difficult when you're trying to aggregate the data to get any full understanding of how it all works. And again, the, philo the philosophical differences uh, between the purpose and outcomes of education. Uh, disaggregating the data is high risk. As I said, we buy into the common good, but what needs to be done is you share the data of your school. And again, that's a no-blame game. So if some schools present their data and the data looks uh, poor in terms of achievement, we don't say to the principal or the teachers in that school, gosh, uh, your picture looks pretty grim. What have you done wrong? It's your fault, lift your game. We simply accept that's the data and then we start to look at solutions and problem solve how we can support that school. Uh, that's, not a diff that's not an easy conversation, however, for some schools to have because it does expose you uh, potentially to criticism. So the, the high level of trust and confidence that the teachers and principals have in each other, the easier those conversations are. Uh, significant industrial employment relation issues. Um, again, because it's early stages, we're working through that. The lead teachers, and in particular the across the school coordinators, some principals think they're absolutely amazing and do great work in their school, and others uh, have some question marks. How you manage that relationship between that principal and that across the school coordinator is uh, something that occupies uh, a lot of my time. Uh, workload issues for project leaders and cold principals. Um, it's been difficult enough being principal of one school but to be project leader of nine schools uh, has been a massive learning curve for me, I have to say. A lot more complex uh, than I thought it was going to be. So what's my um, overall assessment of IES and communities of learning? 
Um, it is the most significant educational reform in the education system in New Zealand since tomorrow's schools. It has the potential to reshape Education New Zealand. Approximately half of students in New Zealand now are in communities of learning. It's already started to lift educational achievement uh, for all students in New Zealand, particularly targeting Māori and Pacific and students with disabilities. There are issues to come, I think, uh, in terms of resourcing and accountability, but I don't think they're insurmountable. And overall, um, I'm very pleased to have been, or very pleased to be the project leader of, um, of nine Catholic schools, uh, faith-based schools. Um, we're just about out of time here, but I'm happy to take some questions from people. Yes. Yes. I have, I have a couple of questions, sure. actually. I, I was writing down my questions. The first one is, this is in the context of a formal government reform. So once, I mean, the, the, the option to construct, to be part of this call or not, is not really an option. It, I mean, eventually everyone is meant to be part of a call. That's, that's the intention of the government, but that they're currently voluntary. Okay. Uh, you can opt into it or not. Okay, and following up on that, once you're in, once you decide to be part of the call, then you are subject to the requirements of the government, but yet you're building at the same time, and, and I mean it, I, mean, I, I'm, I understand this is the idea, you're building on goodwill and consensus. Yes. But can you opt out once you have decided to be part of the test call, or I don't know, this first call? Yes, and that's, that's something that we haven't encountered yet. You do have the uh, ability to opt out of a community of learning, but I'm not aware of anyone that has made that decision as yet. There are some schools that don't want to opt in because they think it's going to be too much work and they don't like the complexity of it or they're high achieving, so they don't see any benefit for their school. Uh, but we haven't had at this stage that I'm aware of any schools that said uh, we don't, we're, we're going to opt out of the cult having been in it. And uh, how long has this been? Because I, I didn't get the, when, when it, it started, the reform? It's, it's, it's been going three years now, and our, our call was one of the first early adopters, so it's been running for two years. And do you have results, not only academic results, but I mean, have you, have you had the chance to assess at least the progress of that? Yes, we have, and we've made progress in boys' writing and we've made very significant progress in our science achievement uh, goal. One thing I did f uh, forget to mention, one of the other major features of it is that the government also gives you inquiry time. And I'm sure you'll all be aware of the importance of uh, inquiry, where you identify a problem uh, around student achievement, you get time to investigate why you think that problem exists, you then get the resources, professional development, you monitor it, and then after a period of time you assess whether the intervention has worked. So all communities of learning get inquiry time, which is very, very important for teachers particularly. Um, they're very busy, they don't have a lot of non-contact time because they're busy teaching or planning, so the inquiry time gives them an opportunity to identify an issue in their class with a particular group or uh, student and be able to research that in order to make progress with those students. Sure. I can I can hear it and I'll just repeat it back.
Uh, yes, yeah, so well, my, my answer to that is that I, I've never met a teacher that doesn't want the best outcomes for their kids. What they lack is a method to be able to do it. And I've been startled uh, with our 300 teachers, some of the amazing stuff that's happening in classrooms. And so when the teachers are able to visit each of the different schools, see that best practice in place, a light bulb moment goes on and they say, well, I've been doing it this way for years, but I can see that this is a better way of doing it. And there's no threat to it because they're not appraising them, uh, they're not monitoring them, they're simply sharing best practice. One example is that we, we had a problem in our secondary school with students writing essays, particularly those students who struggled with English. And we discovered through our aggregated data there was one English teacher that got outstanding results in NCA, even with special needs kids. And we said, That's, how does that happen? So we brought her in and she said, come visit my classroom, I'll show you. And so we did. And what she did was, with the kids, instead of saying, sit down and write an essay, she said, we're going to scaffold it. So this morning, we're going to write one paragraph. And I spent the whole morning doing one paragraph. The next day, they did the next paragraph. And by the end of the week, the student had an amazing essay. Now, some of the teachers said, well, that's cheating because, you know, you've got to write an essay in three hours. But we said, why? Why? The end game is that you've got to write a good quality essay. If it takes three days, what does it matter? And that's what they're able to do. And so that practice now has been shared amongst a lot of the English teachers where they take these students who find it difficult writing and they scaffold and break down the ability to write an essay paragraph by paragraph. Really amazing method. This is my last, my last point, because I'm sure you want to, to get off to morning tea. I think the career structure is a, big, is, is a big feature. I know a lot of teachers are sitting out there, and you're wondering where your careers are going. Now, the communities of learning for the across-the-school te uh, teachers and the lead teachers has enabled them uh, to get extra pay, to effectively promoted, to share their best practice, and to remain in the classroom where their first love is. And um, I think that's something that's a model that I think is one of the best features of communities of learning. Right. Thanks, everyone. It's um, been great to um, be here and to share this with you.